Pardon me. It is now uh, early April, and I've just finished reading Larry Kramer's The Destiny of Me, um, which is kind of like a partner play to The Normal Heart. Um, so in that sense, it's really interesting because you're, you have two characters that progress throughout uh, into the second play, which is Ned and Ben, um, who are just representative of Larry Kramer and Larry Kramer's brother. Um, uh, presumably Larry Kramer's brother. I did not do any research on Larry Kramer, admittedly. Um, so, yeah, so it's interesting in that sense. Um, it, once again, kind of has this very straightforward, very, very direct, willing to call out, you know, it's, it's a play that in the introduction, Larry Kramer basically says that it's, it's his life play. He says that all writers in some way have this sort of thing, story that's inside of them that they write at some point and most of them if they're a good writer get thrown out or destroyed and he decided that he was going to try to publish this one gets published uh it gets produced and whatnot um so really this is i mean it's a play about larry Kramer's life and his envisioning of it right um so in that sense also once again very very interesting um on the play itself um having never seen a production of this but way that i envision this this is like a i mean this could be like an an hour play i think maybe like an hour and a half um because the way of the way i envision this kind of being set up is a stage split into two halves one half is the hospital room the other half is everything else um and it's generally the um part that they grew up in and then sometimes it is uh like his college dorm and things like that um so stage wise right you're, you're not having a lot of like you're, not, you're never doing blackout scenes or anything. It, you're going, going, going from each scene to each scene to each scene. Um, and even the way that the dialogue works, I, I envision it being very layered right on top of each other. Um, I think a lot of times in when, when you do stage productions, there's a desire to leave gaps in between pieces of dialogue because it is a live production and therefore you're needing to have people understand every word um and process it before we move on to the next thing but in this production in the destiny of me i would i would really say that you want to get rid of that and you just want to layer 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 and say each line immediately right after another like like almost it is a continuous sentence between each character right um so in that sense I, th I think it's a really interesting play uh because of that right because you're not i mean this is this is an hour and a half of just constant going through this like you're not even even though there's act breaks there's th it's a three act play even though there's act breaks i probably wouldn't even do that i would probably just keep going um because i think it really adds to the feelings that that are being expressed in the play um because it is a, a back and forth between what ned is experiencing at this moment and next experiences leading up to this moment um and really kind of the comparison and the reliving of what happened to youth is now re is now happening again when he's seeking treatment um so that's that um, another interesting thing about the play itself is that you're having, it's, it's a play in which you're having more or less kind of this metaphysical dream type thing that's becoming real and interacting with the character. 
and then eventually interacts with all of the characters um in which you're more or less going from Ned talking to Alexander, Alexander being Ned's younger self, um, and, and this kind of relationship between the two of them, and also Alexander seeking out help and support from older Ned. Um, so I think it's another, another interesting dynamic that's being played on there. Um, so yeah, the themes of the play and things things about it um i i this play i mean it has a very very big anti-capitalist feel to it and i really think that's that's the underlying thing that's really kind of being talked about here but it's through the guise of medicine um because what's what's being mentioned what's happening is this this idea that um Basically, it was money and money issues that made Alexander's parents the, the, the way that they were. And therefore, taking out those frustrations onto Ben and, and, and Alexander, um, which causes Alexander to become Ned, and Ned to become the person that he is. Um, and it's just the cycle of money and desire for money and, and never feeling secure in terms of monetary status and therefore not being kind of accepted or being able or like just living kind of this happy life that is envisioned. Um, Money just pops up a lot, a lot, a lot throughout it. Um, money is, of course, the big issue that actually gets talked about at the very end. When they're talking about um, Ned and Tony, Tony is the doctor that's developing, what is attempting to develop the cure for, or the treatment for HIV AIDS. And Ned's envisionment of it is that um, Ned's envisionment of it is that Tony and the government um, are not seeking adequate treatment and ad adequate cures for HIV AIDS because there is no money to be made in it. Um, and, and blames the president for a lot of things uh, because it Ned is basically pitting this as a Republican problem, which makes sense because when the issue first starts arising, HIV AIDS, we have President Reagan in office um, and it gets largely ignored and then gets cut from budgets and everything. And then when Ned is actually seeking treatments and going to get these experimental drugs, uh, it is President Bush in office, and same deal here, just kind of this pushing away, refusing to deal with it, right? And then Tony says, um, it basically asks, do you think this would be different if we had a different president in office? And he's very right, because at the end of the day, this is a, a, a monetary issue. Um, it does not matter who is in charge because there is never going to be any sort of political or monetary gain from developing the cure to HIV AIDS. I mean, it just isn't because this is a group of people who are almost entirely set in their ways of voting and in their economic status. People who are LGBTQ+, and people who have HIV AIDS 
are historically on the lower end of socioeconomic terms. And so there is no money to be made there from a political standpoint. And because the large majority of LGBTQ plus um, people are liberal in some way and tend to vote democratically, well, there's no need to then support them because you already know how they're going to vote. Um, another example I think of this is, is why Republican presidents can um, bash California so much and why there's, there's a generally a lack of refusal from Republican presidents to support California. And it's because there's an understanding that um, this is a state that is never going to is never going to ever turn Republican in, in voting, especially for presidency. However, you still have massive swaths of people and massive, you know, areas of land that are Republican in California. It's just that the state itself is never going to vote Republican. So why would a president ever help them? We actually saw this in a... Um, uh, when President Trump was in office and we had the wildfires going on in California and the refusal to help California in that, in, during the wildfires, um, it did not matter that the wildfires were actually affecting areas of, of the state that had voted Republican. It did not matter because California was never going to turn Republican in the presidency so why, why would a Republican president ever help them? Same thing goes for here. Why would a Republican president ever help people who suffer from HIV AIDS? Because they're never going to turn Republican. The same thing goes for a Democratic president. Why would a Democratic president ever help California? Because they're gonna vote Democratic anyway. Why would a, why would a Democratic president ever help in the HIV AIDS crisis, they wouldn't because these people are going to vote Democratic anyway. Right. Um, so shout out to that because it's, it's just a huge political and monetary issue, right? Um, the other thing about this book or about this play, um, there's really kind of this envisionment of science and medicine working in a way that is like in the movies um, and in in novels and right. It, there's kind of this envisionment of we're just going to spend money and we're going to find a cure. But anyone who works in sciences and works in medicine knows that is not how this happens. Right, because if that were, if that were how this all works, and we could just dump money into it and we'd be fine, we wouldn't have heart disease and we wouldn't have cancer, right? But there's this kind of positioning that is that Ned puts out, and therefore Larry Kramer puts out, which is that that's how medicine should work, is that we should be able to just find things because we put money into it. Um, so, you know, like, that's, which certainly is not the case, right? And I think the knee-jerk reaction is to then go and point, look at COVID, right? and say, well, they were able to find a vaccine relatively quickly for this, so why why would they not be able to for anything else? And, and the reason for that is because of data and because of what COVID affected. One of the things that gets kind of buried inside all, all of what happened with COVID is the amount of data sharing that happened. Um, right, we have, we have massive a huge reason as to why the United States companies were able to 
develop vaccines so quickly was because of the amount of data that was shared with them from researchers in China. Like, that's, that's just a simple fact. And the mass amount of data points that they had. That would not be the case. Like, we, we would probably be still not have a vaccine if researchers tried to not do that. So then when you're looking at HIV AIDS, what you're looking at is a complication of people who are infected wise are spread out along a really a pretty far timeline uh, when you're considering things and when you're considering the way the epidemics work. But then you're also considering the fact that there are a lot of people who would refuse to take part in research because for a very long time, right, admitting that you're gay opens you up to a lot of other things, right? And admitting that you have HIV AIDS opens you up to so many other issues. And it's still a very much a... Um, stereotyped, I guess, um, discriminatory or discriminized um, disease. It really is. And so you have a lot of people that are not willing to be, be a part of research because of that. And so your research and your data points are way, way lower. Um, the other thing is when you're looking at what what each one of these affected. When you're looking at HIV AIDS, the group of people that are affected the most are people that are in the arts and are in um, kind of entertainment and things of that nature. And historically, these people are not very high up in the socio socioeconomic tier list. They're just not. But when you're looking at COVID, well, what did COVID do? COVID shut down everything. And so there was a huge economic crisis because of COVID, which is also part of the reason why they spent so much, they acted on it so quickly because it shut down everything and it was affecting people who had power. And I would argue that if that was not the case and we did not shut down travel and we did not shut down trades, trading and whatnot, and there was not an economic crisis that went hand in hand with COVID, then the research and the development of vaccines would not have happened as quickly because from the same thing that I had talked about earlier, why would you, right? From a political standpoint, why would you invest money in something that is not harming your chances of being reelected? So that's that. Um, that's really kind of my thoughts on the destiny of me. Uh, I know a lot of it was talking about other things, but I think that's, a, that's the only way I can kind of piece this together, I think, is to talk about what is, what is happening in the world right now. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that is that's just me, Valerie Kramer. Um